Good afternoon. Um, my name is Rachel Dry. It's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I'm actually an, a politics editor at the New York Times, so I feel very um, honored that they trusted me not to be too like terribly unfun <laughs> to be here with you today. I promise, like if anyone wants to talk about Smithsonian beer guts, I will not edit you on the fly. Um, I think we should take a moment. We're so lucky to be here with the film's director, and it was such an incredible film, so um, I'd, I'd love to give Janice Engel a round of applause. Thank you. And of course, it probably needs no introduction, but we're also so lucky to be here with a woman who uh, played Molly Ivins. We, Molly Ivins was brought to life, of course, by the film, and then has been brought to life on stage by none other than Kathleen Turner. Yeah, Just, I'm not finished with her yet. I'm so pleased to hear it. We should, we should get right into that. Um, well, I wanted, Rachel, uh, can I do one thing? Because oh. there's a couple of people here in the audience who actually are part of my crew and people who are actually in the film, and I'd like you all to please stand. Sure. Christy Tully, my fabulous DP. Hi. Ian Herbert, my auspicious music supervisor. Thank you. He's here somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Green, Molly's uh, agent and executor of her estate, the gatekeeper. Charlie Kaiser, Charles, th thank you. Margot and Garth, are you here? Johnston? And um, of course, Kathleen, who actually was graciously gave me an interview, but didn't make this cut, but that's, she's, now. Nah. Oh, all right, we got I'm the director's the cut live in person, <laughs> yeah. Well, so nobody else gets to see this part. This is what didn't make the film. Um, I wanted to start, um, for both of you, I'll go to Janice first, w what it was like to be immersed in Molly's work, especially the way she talks about civil rights, civil liberties, um, and the responsibility of every citizen at this moment. You said you've spent the last six years with her. Um, how do you think about that relevant to where we are now and, and what sort of a message or, or call to action might you hope this film would be? Well, thank you for that question. As I've been saying, I, I have climbed a mountain called Molly. I did a deep archival, or as we say, archeological dig and um, there's so much that I discovered, and I've really been going to school. I look at every project I do as a, of, it's all about, it's like another, you know, way to educate myself. I, I jokingly say I've gone to the Populism University taught by Molly Ivins and Jim Hightower for the past six years. Well, I'd rather take her version of populism than some other options. Well, I think it's been misguided, and I, I could talk about that for, you know, it's not an alt right thing, it's about top to bottom. So much of what Molly said, 15, 20, 30 years ago is happening right now. She is you know, so prescient, but she also was this incredible, incredible um, ab absorbed history. She was a scholar of history, and she knew that you know, history is cyclical. And so what she wrote about, she knew would repeat itself. But the thing is, is that the cycles are happening faster and the gaps are smaller. So I would say that today Molly is probably more relevant now than when she was alive. I've gotten shit for that. Um, I don't mean it in, out of disrespect, but she would agree, I believe, that the shit is that much worse. And her, what she says is a call to action. The overriding message is it is up to us. Jim Hightower said it to do the heavy lifting. It's we the people, people. So. All y'all need to get out, and I'm, I, we got a lot of people who are baby boomers, my, my crowd, but I see young people here. You have to tell your children, your grandchildren. Somebody in uh, Austin, in one of the articles, said this is a gift to the online generation. Molly was Twitter ready in the 80s. Get out there and spread. She really needs to get to the people, and it is a call to action because nobody's going to do it. No, no big daddy's going to fix it for us, and we need to get that message out that we have to take back our democracy. Thank you for that. And, and um, really no better message, I would argue, than the um, like delicious words that Molly used to make her point. So um, Kathleen, I, I definitely want to hear about your experience meeting her. But I wanted to start um, by asking, when you were playing her, when you were embodying her in that film, was there any line of hers or any particular phrase or moment? You know, there are so many, um, anything that sort of connected you with her most or, or you kept in mind? Well, uh, I performed uh, the one woman show, Red Hot Patriot, the kick-ass wit of Molly Ivins, 
for the last six years or more. Uh, I will continue to do it because, as you've said, it is absolutely relevant. There's, there's nothing in the play or in her words that isn't still needed today. Uh, I think what I've taken more than anything else from her is the joy and how she writes and, and wrote, you know, all right, beloveds. Uh, and she, I believe her. I believe that she loved uh, her readers and loved Americans. And she's that, she's changed me. I think that I am more tolerant and more loving uh, because of her. I wondered, um, you, you promised earlier um, a story about having the great pleasure of meeting Molly Ivins and Ann Richards, which that roast footage is incredible. That's um, <laughs> truly to be in that room. I mean, we got a, it was pretty good to be in this room, but I can only imagine how amazing it would have been to be there in real life. So <laughs> what was um, like a in-person well, version I, of the Ann and Molly I met, show? I met Molly uh, many times, actually, because we would sort of trade off. I'd go speak for the AC, to the ACLU, and she'd come and speak for people for the American Way. We were both sort of spokespeople for these organizations. But I lived at you know, 66 M Broadway, and I walked in the lobby one day, and waiting for the elevator are Ann Richards and Molly. <laughs> and uh, they kind of looked at each other, and they looked at me, and Molly said, well, you're coming with us. I said, I guess so. So we went up to Anne's apartment. She was staying there while she was having her treatments. And uh, they started to tell stories on each other. And now I was kind of like fresh meat, right? <laughs> and so I think the one that really stuck with me and that stays with me, yeah, Molly told about Anne. She said, now, when Annie was just starting out in politics. All the real business was done at the backyard barbecues. So Annie went one day with uh, a young female assistant from her office and a young black man that she had just hired. And these good old boys would come over and they'd say, Annie, God, you are beautiful. And who is this sweet young thing? And they'd just go right past the black man, wouldn't even see him. So Molly said, you know, Annie commenced to become perturbed. So when the next old boy came over and said, you are more beautiful than ever, how do you do it? He said, well, thank you, George. I'd like you to meet my new husband. That's a particularly good line. I wonder... On that point, you know, that's um, a sort of leadership that uh, a woman is probably uniquely able to um, enact, you know, um, deciding to be someone's wife on the spot and um, thereby elevating him in the eyes of um, whichever good old boy is milling about. Um, Janice, I wonder if you could speak about um, how Molly viewed her power as a woman or thought about feminism or, or women in leadership and, and how that might resonate today. So it might be interesting to y'all, and some of you already know this. Molly's thing, her thing, because of when she came up, was civil rights. You know, she came up during the civil rights movement and the Peace Corps, and she says it in there, and the Vietnam War and all of that. And in terms of feminist issues, and the, as she said, it took a long time for the women's movement to come to the great state. And that actually was true. Molly never focused on that. She didn't focus on the snake pit. She just took her mantle. She was always, as you saw, forward moving. So that, she was on a lot of panels with um, um, Gloria Steinem and she did stuff for now, but that really wasn't um, underscoring what she did. Um, although what she did is clearly a, I mean, a feminist role model. But it wasn't, it was, I mean, she wrote a few things, but not a lot. It was really about, you know, basically, who's getting screwed and who's doing the screwing. 
And that was really her, you know, that's, she was, you know, about holding, speaking truth to power and holding the powers that be accountable and using humor. And Jim Hightower didn't make another thing that ended up kill your babies, on the editing room floor, Jim Hightower said, Molly knew that humor was the door key to, to the brain. You have to unlock that little door to get people to listen to you. And she's right. And I mean, if we look at it today, who do people go to for their news? Comedians, comics. I had a whole conversation with Rachel Maddo about that. And if you were to look at what goes on, the all the comics that are brilliant and political, and I mean, they're, right now they're having their heyday on he who shall not be named. Um, they, they're going to town. Well, they need the investigative journalism that goes on, that's done by the journalists. And also, the comedians have a, a, a staff of writers that work for them. The investigative journalists may have stringers and this and that. And Molly Ivins was one person doing what a whole slew of people do, twice a week, and a, and a high-functioning alcoholic. <laughs> It is quite remarkable to put that all in perspective. I um, what I thought you know, was thinking today is is such a good day for this because um, you know Molly explained Texas to a lot of the world, especially the Northeast, and um, you know helped readers feel like they really were there. And and today I think outside we really can feel like we're there in Texas. Like so, I was just thinking that as um, <clears throat> the AC hasn't quite made it up to the stage and as full force as one would want. But I wondered, um, Kathleen, if you could talk about that, especially you know performing and thinking about people who come experience Molly through you. Like, how did she want people to understand with an open mind people who weren't like them? You know? Mm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, a portion uh, in the play where uh, it's toward the very end and she's saying, you know, um, beloved, it's not much time left. She says, once upon a time in Waco, we had a newspaper editor named William Brand. Now, he hated three things, Kant, hypocrisy, and Baptists. <laughs> he said, the only problem with our Texas Baptists is we do not hold them underwater long enough. <laughs> so we lost William when he was shot in the back by an irate Baptist. Lying on the sidewalk, he got to his own gun and blew his murder to kingdom come. Well, that is one way to get out of town. But I want more than that. I want people on the streets banging pots and pans. Do not give up your legacy because of boredom or cynicism or neglect. You have more political power than 99% of the people who have ever lived on this planet. I, every night when I would go through that, I was Sorry, just... Sorry, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a minute. <laughs> uh, well, it, I mean, this is truly... Stand up, man. Stand up. Uh, don't, don't let it go by. Don't do nothing if you feel strongly. You know, there are any... Ah, how many time, ways to, to, to act, to, to do whatever. Um, find them. Do them. That's what I think of her. So, Molly's, yeah, <laughs> that was a good call to action as well. Um, Ma, we, heard we talked beforehand to make sure we get you all roused up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so specifically on that point, um, you know, Molly was speaking a little bit about I think in the film you have her talking about Ann Richards as a role model um, and the sort of somewhat limited um, roster of female role models. So, and the film I think is, is quite a strong argument for Molly Ivins as a role model. What, what would you say would be the sort of top three things? If, if we're emulating Molly Ivins as a role model, what are we doing? So Janice, I'll go to you first. Speaking truth to power. <laughs> always come from your place of what's real to you. And, and I think kindness. Molly, and, and you pointed that out, she is filled with joy. She loved people. people, and she loved her country. And this is our country. And, and you know, she said, you know, it, it is up to us. And, and the fact is, is that we have to overturn Citizens United. Corporations are not people. <laughs> They're corporations controlled by very greedy, power-mongering people. And we really need to take it back. And, and, and I think that, you know, 
Look, I think that there's a, I think we have much more in common with those we are not talking to now than, than that we think. And um, we need to really engage. And that really means about boots on the ground. And do what you can, but it is boots on the ground. Go out, engage, and talk to people. That's what's stopped. And they want that. They want to polarize us. Kathleen, what would you say if, if we're saying we're put, making Molly Evans a role model? What would, what would you oh, put I think on the list? Oh, she absolutely is a role model. I mean, I think, I think that she had an extraordinary skill and intelligence that uh, I certainly don't have. Um, so that is not my path. But I feel I have a voice and uh, one that is heard. And I want to use it. I think that everyone has the ability to affect change. And it's your responsibility to do it. Thank you. Janice, I wondered, um, speaking specifically about the obligations of citizenship, um, it was interesting to leave in that moment where she talks about not voting um, in 1996, right? Or 1996. 96. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that decision and, and offering that? Um, more complex picture of Molly Ivins? Well, I will tell you the truth about because, of course, it's an edit. So she didn't vote in the presidential election, but she did vote in all the down ballots. So she always voted, but that was her protest, and she knew Bill Clinton, and she was so... I, that footage is so unusual that we found. I mean, she, it, it, she, it's called... Actually, the footage is called Raw, Raw Story. She's raw. It looks like she'd been on a bender, and she just and it was at the plaza, and they got her in the morning. And Great she, place for a bender. <laughs> and she let it rip. And it was Molly Ivins unabashed. I mean, she was angry. And so I thought it was a really good, you know, this is not a hagiography. This is warts and all and who she was in her heart. And that's how she felt. Um, uh, I think that we are in a stage right now, and I think she would probably agree that everybody must vote. This is essential. The reason we are in the place we are in is because I think it's 63 or 65 percent, you can answer that better than me, that did not vote in our last presidential election. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's why I was interested, the footage in that context, but I think it's um, important to show her, you know, as a full person who had that protest moment. I wonder, I know you said this was your, your conversation didn't make the film, so we're gonna get a little bit of it here. Um, I was told that um, Kathleen's performance was an inspiration to you for this project. I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about that while we're here together. Yes, it was. So thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. So um, James Egan, who's not here, my, one of my producing partners, James Egan and Carlisle Vandervoort, who is our native Texan. We have a real Texan. Um, she's not here as well. But they, so, so James approached me. He'd been wanting to make a film with me for a while. And he called me up, literally. I think two days before I went to see the play. And he said, you have to go to the Geffen. It's the last week. You have to go see Kathleen Turner and Red Hot Patriot, the kick-ass widow Molly Ivins. And I said, why? He said, just don't ask, go. I said, OK. So I went, and I bought a ticket. And I got like slightly off center, third row. I was right there. And I think you had a cold that week. I don't remember. But I was so, I, I mean, I think that's, but I, because I think you, we talked about that. But you were so amazing and the material was so amazing that I, I got home and I Googled till three in the morning, Molly Ivins. Now I will admit that I really was not part of Molly's constituency. I grew up in New York and I lived in LA. And so she wasn't in my papers. So I wasn't familiar with her, nor was J James is so ashamed of this because he's such a, a you know, a American civil liberty. Like he said, I didn't know who she was either. And I told, he went to see you and he told you backstage. And that's when he had found out that. And he, I called him the next morning. And I said, I'm blown away. She is wildly funny and so spot on. What's up? And he said, nothing's ever been done. And that's what he had said to you. And I said, nothing's ever been done. He said, nope, except for the play. And I said, whoa. So we reached out to the Engel sisters who wrote the play. My last name is also Engel. We all spell it the same way. And in- well, you're not related. But we're not related, but I joke that we're from sh some shtetl somewhere. But the, the fact is, is that angel in many languages means angel. So I used to say that Molly has her brigade of angels doing her bidding for her down here. And, that's, and we were off and running. We, we got to her, her chief of stuff, Betsy Moon, the gatekeepers, and Dan Green. And uh, I think six weeks later, I was on a plane to Texas. Kathleen, I wonder, um, so obviously the, the performance was inspirational. And, and now we have this incredible piece of work that um, 
I hope and believe will bring Molly Ivan's work to a new audience and, and a, a broader national recognition. I wonder if you could talk us about um, what it felt like, what it feels like to be Molly Ivan's for uh, how long is the show? Is it ninety minutes? To wh when uh, you're in about, yeah eighty eighty minutes when you're embodying those words. <laughs> I bet there are a lot of laugh breaks. Yeah. What does it feel like to be done and, and to have been swimming in Molly, in Molly Ivan's well, words? Well, she was, I, I think I've got a natural affinity for her. Honest to gosh, I, I sure. just felt right at home. I think everyone would agree. I put, on those, I put on those red boots and I just went, oh yeah. Uh, um, I, I, went down, I went to tell this story. Um, I, I loved living with Molly. I, I, I loved the, I've done it, the uh, four runs of the play, and I will, as I said, continue. I will do more. But I went down to um, Texas, Austin, for twice. The uh, Texas Observer asked me to come, uh, both once when they were honoring Molly, Molly and once when they were celebrating their own 50th or 70th or something anniversary. So I met a bunch of these people that Molly lived and worked with. And after the event uh, at the hotel, we, they took me to this bar where they always used to drink together. And these guys could drink six double scotches in an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is where Molly grew up. And I finally, I was saying to one of them, you've been telling me about your house out of town. Tell me you're not driving. <laughs> he says, no, I'll keep a place in town just in case. You know? <laughs> Thank God, uh, but I thought about how this is this is where she lived. These hard drinking, hard working, uh, stubborn people. <laughs> I she was very much shaped by being in Texas, by being a Texan. Yes. Um, did she? How does she relate to other characters you've played? Does she remind you of um, anyone else who you've? Been over the um, years? Um, no, no, not really. I mean, the, one of the things I love about Molly and love about playing Molly is the is obviously the humor. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher also, and I, I often I tell my my students, um, look, you know, drama is really easier. The big emotions, fear, you know. Uh, Hatred, uh, anger, all these are gut punches that you just have to throw out at the audience and they'll react. But humor, you have to make someone think. They're not going to laugh until they've got the idea. So I love humor because I know when I get that laugh that they thought it through. You know, and you just go, well, ha, ha, ha. You know, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Um, with the laughter, and I wonder, Janice, I, do you have a favorite Molly Ivins line or joke that, that's most most present for you? What's your favorite? Oh, uh, there's so many. I, so you saw the ones in there, but the, a couple that didn't make it. I'm not anti-gun. I'm pro-knife. <laughs> and she wrote a whole column about the why a knife is well. I mean, in light of because people were getting stabbed, I thought political correctness. I, I didn't want to put that in, but but th th it's hilarious because you'll get exercise when you you have to run when you have a knife, and <laughs> it was it was wildly funny. Um, she did a whole column on how gays coin up the town in Texas, like when towns were losing their economy and people were moving out. She said, "Just oh, just get the gays to come here. They'll fix up the town. They'll coin up the town, and you'll, you'll the money will come back in." There, there, I, I, there are so many funny Molly bits that I'm hoping will be on bonus materials. I have to dig through. Um, you know, just, you know, if his IQ slips any lower, I'll have to order him twice a day. I mean, that one's in there. Um, the Newt Gingrich one. Oh my God! Dope smoking dead. Was it dope, dope smoking deadbeat dad who divorced his dying wife? I mean, come on, Twitter ready. She was twi even even what she said about Buchanan. I'm sure his speech sounded so much better in its original German. Now that one has been appropriated and used for he who shall not be named. As you notice, he's nowhere in this film. I didn't want him in this film, but it is implied. It was implied. Um, well, I just want to say congratulations on again on this incredible project. Thank you. And, um, <laughs>
And, and for bringing those incredible jokes and the incredible force with which Molly Ivins argued for what she believed in into the conversation at this moment when it feels deeply relevant. And um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And um, thank you very much for Kathleen Turner to being here with us as well. Um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.